Hi, I'm Mervyn Gray. I'm the CEO of uh, Zoof Digital. Hello, Anthony, at the back there. Good to see a familiar face. Essentially, uh, this afternoon, I'll be talking to you about going from ideas to reality. When it comes to technology and digital strategy and really harnessing the power of connectivity, so IoT as we uh, commonly call it today. So a little bit about Zoof, which I think is mandatory for to understand where we're coming from. We have a long history with, with venturing, really supporting high-tech startup companies to devise their digital strategies, to design their products, and to take them to the cloud, so software as a service type business models, with connected devices and sensors that play a role in delivering their services. And everything that we do with those very agile, fast-moving, high-tech startup companies, we have brought over to a digital services arm that allows us to work with grown-up companies in the same sort of context. They all have challenges with innovation, just one happens to be quite a bit bigger than the other. So, we've got locations across Europe. Uh, our HQ here is in Ireland, uh, with outposts in Finland and Hungary. And I'm not sure how many of you know about these kinds of technologies that we tend to work with. But we work with cloud platforms that you probably hear about, so like Amazon, Microsoft, and SAP, which could be relevant to you or not relevant to you, depending on your scenario. And of course, technologies that allow us to deliver IoT through mobile devices or other sensors, and indeed artificial intelligence. They're all ingredients, per se, that you can utilize and employ to create a solution. Now, IoT is a buzzword in its own right. Uh, we're all familiar with it. We all have an idea of what it means, and perhaps it's all different. Uh, and yet, there's a common thread. It's really about connected things that exchange data, communicate in new ways, and offer us new ways to communicate with them. And as a result of this, we have indeed also ah, changed how we live. So our lives are very much connected. To give you a very personal example, in my own home, I happen to have a wind turbine that produces energy. The wind turbine's connected to an inverter that happens to be connected to a device for rerouting excess energy to an immersion heater that happens to be connected to a smart car charger that is connected to my car physically and digitally and also to an Amazon powered uh, hotspot for Wi-Fi which is connected to ALF, the vacuum cleaner who takes instructions quite well from Alexa when you ask me to do so, he's happy to be busy and ultimately all of these things are connected to me through portals and through apps. Even right now, my watch is buzzing when people are contacting me, telling me something's going on. So fundamentally, these are all the ingredients in my home that change the way I live and how I perceive living, and I can regulate my home. And the same advantages can be brought to a business. The real question is, is your business connected? Does it need to be? And if so, why? Why do you need to be connected? What's the real value for you? It's very easy to be seduced by all the buzzwords we hear. So IoT is, is one overarching concept. You also have other things like artificial intelligence or indeed blockchain, uh, like cryptocurrencies are built on, but they also have value for other sorts of purposes. But also it's a case that you can be seduced into the wrong kind of solution if you're not aware and you don't do your homework. For example, I've had a sports company, large organization, approach me saying, we want a digital ticketing solution built on blockchain. And then you think about access control at a venue, scanning a ticket that's regulated by blockchain, and you realize it will take 10 minutes to scan the ticket. So blockchain is very useful for certain purposes, but not necessarily that one. So the buzzword has a purpose, has a meaning, but not in that context. And of course, we also have all these kinds of connected enablers that we can bring into solutions that we create for manufacturing organizations or businesses. You've got IP-connected cameras, you've got the devices on your arm, you've got mobile phones, you've got Amazon Alexa, and of course, other technologies like NFC, or indeed RFID, which is probably used by eFlow to charge many of you this morning if you use the M50 toll. And these are wonderful cocktails that you can put together but they may or may not have the right value or may or may not be the right answer for you. So what we're looking at doing is really making you aware of a set of methodologies that can be applied to help you to define what is the right solution for your particular problem. So service and user experience design incorporates several different kind of legs on the stool that you need to look at. Most importantly, 
you need to look at the business. So what are your business goals? Do you have some extremely challenging revenue target? Do you want to get to a new audience? Do you want to enable more optimized manufacturing? Do you want to understand better how your organization is performing? And so on. What are the real business drivers? Then you look at the human factors. How will people in their context today need to move or change to a new world? How can you satisfy them with, with a new solution? What context will they live in? How will they behave in a new world? And you need to factor all of those things together and only when you understand the problem from a business and human point of view would you then prescribe the answer, which it would typically include technology. But the point is that technology is derived from understanding of the problem, not the prescribed answer up front. I'm going to give you an example of this process in just a moment. Basically, you go through a phase of discovery. That's really immersing yourself into the problem domain, talking with all the stakeholders from business and human point of view, extrapolating all their knowledge so that you can then interpret that into a design and ultimately deliver and build a solution that they need. I'm going to give you one example here. I'm going to challenge a few of you to answer the question for me at the end. But if these were four requirements that I gave you, so we need a product that has four wheels, comfortable seat, a steering wheel, and a four-stroke engine. What could the product be? I'm going to ask the gentleman here who introduced me. Declan, what could it be? Okay. Declan suggested it could be a car. Any others? A lady. What could it be? It could be a boat and a trailer. Okay, interesting. The point being that requirements in themselves are quite ambiguous. I could ask many of you what this product would be and you each would give me a different answer. But if I told you that through this immersion into the problem space, we could uncover a gold nugget requirement, that it should also cut grass. Declan, do you know what it is now? You do. What is it? A compound harvester, he said. What do you think it could be? Absolutely. So really, it could be a lawnmower. But if you miss that fact, you would build the wrong product inherently. And nobody would be happy. Your business objectives would not be satisfied, nor would your end users. Alright. And ultimately the product of this process would be a real understanding of the people, the real humans who play a role in delivering your solution or your product. You would create a persona for them that describes a day in their life. What do they do from 9 to 5 every day? What are their frustrations, their priorities? How do they behave today? And when you introduce something new for them, how will they behave in the future? How will you satisfy the requirements and eliminate the frustrations and make them better at what they do? You can translate this understanding into what we call wireframes. It allows you to articulate what the solution will be, to validate your designs, your solutions, with all the stakeholders, and ultimately you can produce something that feels good, looks good, and does what it's supposed to do at the end of the day. Now, some discovery examples. Here we'll give you examples of some companies that have gone through the process of discovery, really finding things out and pivoting on the way. Extracts. What you will see here is a diagram depicting G-Force taken from a telematics black box, so an IoT connected device, deployed in cars. So for example, in Italy, they use this with, along with insurance policies. The idea was that this data would be taken from the black box in the event of an accident, would be analyzed by the claim staff, so they could determine what really happened leading up to an incident. But I can imagine that like me, most of you can't quite interpret this graph for what it is. You need a PhD in physics to interpret it properly. So what we did was investigate the area and convert all the data from the, the, the telematics uh, equipment into a narrative that fundamentally tells a story to the claims handlers, showing them bit by bit what happened leading up to an event, like harsh acceleration, harsh braking, harsh cornering, and then the incident, where it occurred, where it hit in the car, etc. All of a sudden, they didn't need to think too much about the data because they had a narrative or story that told it to them. They only had to read it. Another example is my good man Anthony down the back here uh, from Kaizen Tree. Anthony's been a Lean Six Sigma consultant for many, many years. Uh, would consult organizations about optimizing their processes. Um, and you realize that he would leave the organizations after helping them to optimize. And then they would 
go back into old bad habits. He had nothing to leave behind. But we discovered that we could install into manual production lines tablets that essentially would allow manual operators on those lines to record information on the fly with big controls to allow them to use muscle memory, which they're akin to doing, and ultimately, uh, could provide a real-time feedback about the organization performance quality metrics to the management, who of course are being big brother and looking over this in the background. All right, we're going to do one more IoT challenge. Uh, and I'm going to skip along here for the sake of time. I'm going to test you all. Can you get your mobile devices out, please? And you've got a chance to win a Fitbit if you do, by the way. So please, get your Fitbits out, or your mobiles out. Open your browser and navigate to this link, iotexpo.zeusgroup.com. Okay? I'm going to give you all a few seconds to do it. You might just give me a nod when you're done so that I can move to the next one. Good stuff. Great. Good. Still working? Are you all there? All right. I'm going to navigate to another page, but the link will still be on it. Here you can see, right now, there are 13 people logged in. Your devices are IoT devices. They are connected. I can see you connected. 21 right now. I can see the distribution of Android and iOS devices. So, 50% of you have Android, and interestingly, 50% of you have iOS devices too. Okay? Now, if you opted to put your name and details in on the form and check a little box, you're now in a raffle. So you have fundamentally sent me your details. Okay? And I'm going to produce a winner randomly here. So. Seamus? Seamus David? Good man. You're a winner. Thank you for taking part. I'm going to do one more. And Patrick McKillian. Excellent. Well done, guys. So you both get a Fitbit, okay? So you can find us back here over this fence just afterwards. All right. Uh, so, just going back. And moving on. Right. Now I know that 50% of you had an iOS device, okay? So if I was looking at a target market, for example, I now know that 50% of you are my market if I'm targeting iOS. I know that if you take your iOS device out, and you can try this again, try to scan this code with your iOS device. And those using Android, please try to do the same. Open your camera, try to scan one of the QR codes to give you our contact details. What you should find is that most of you using iOS devices can capture the details, correct? And the Android people are probably struggling. You're seeing nothing happen. My point is that if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to provide a solution that organically scans QR codes, maybe iOS is the better platform and device for you off the bat. Android won't do it out of the box. You'll need to modify it somehow. Uh, if you want to talk more about IoT, design, uh, innovation, you can find us just behind this wall here. Uh, looking forward to talking to you. you guys, come collect your prizes. Thank you.